University, and uh, I did a presentation on grounding, I don't know, probably two years ago, and, and then Lisa asked me an email, said, hey, I saw your stuff on your website or purezet.com, could you use grounding again? I said, well, I guess I could. So at the end of the presentation, if you really like it, come and see me. If you didn't like it, Lisa is KC1YL, and you know. <laughs> So it's really, really great to be with everybody here tonight. So, um, so I'm going to go ahead and do my motions to William here to go ahead and go to the next one. So the next slide, this could be your station. Yes, this is an actual amateur radio operator, AA4XX. Uh, he was a ham for 40 years. He never, never had any grounding on any of his coax lines. And because he said, hey, lightning's up there in my house. Um, it hit his house. Oh, by the way, he was not in the seat when I came down. I didn't know that. Um, go ahead there you go. Um, this could be your home. Guess where this is? This is a screenshot from Paul Delgado, Fox 13, in Seminole, Florida, about three weeks ago. Yeah, now let's say your house is the one on the left, okay? And are you grounding protected at your hand today? This is just a question. Thank you for well, just a little bit about me. I'm uh, for GRC. Um, got my novice license. How many people had a W or a K in N4 license, novice license? Okay, yes, I was a member of the novice licenses with the N, yeah. So I upgraded. I worked for a few years with the Dominican Republic. That was always fun. So I worked for a portable HIA. And I uh, got my extra class now. Uh, what I do for work is I'm product life manager for wireless and Duke Energy. And it's a pretty big job, but it's, I've got a great team I work with. And if you do Twitter, I'm at uh, GRK. By the way, I didn't do Twitter until like seven or eight years ago, and I'm a Wi-Fi nerd, and that's what I do for my work. That's what they pay me to do with you. Um, and so all the, all, all the Wi-Fi guys and gals are on Twitter. I said, nah, you know, so I started following the R. And so that's the reason I'm on, on Twitter. I don't do a lot of old social media stuff, but I'm on Twitter because Wi-Fi people are there. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, that'd be great. I can follow you as well. But, okay, next slide. Um, Lightning areas of the world. I'm going to try to follow on here as well. Um, these are lightning hotspots that have at least a thousand people living nearby. Lake Maracaibo, Venezuela, and there's two places in the, 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 the Democratic Republic of the Congo in Africa. And next slide kind of gives us those where those are. You see in the middle of Africa there, that blue? That's the lightning hotspots of the world. This is a great website, by the, by the way, visolid.com, V-A-I-S-A-L-A, -E, has tons of wireless, or I should say, grounding and lightning information on there, and I've got some nice statistics from there. Um, next slide tells us about, um, well, actually, I have a question, too. Can lightning strike twice in the Tampa Bay area? And the next slide will say it does strike twice. <laughs> 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 Any hockey fans here? Okay, okay, okay good. But uh, I'll, I'll just say go Bulls and move on. Um, the uh, lightning capitals in the U.S. though, we used to say Tampa Bay area was the lightning capital, but uh, Visolid.com does all these statistics and stuff, and their 2020 report showed, and the next slide will tell us, um, it's actually it's North Texas, Oklahoma, it's the lightning capital. And the reason for that, the moisture, uh, the moisture waves and, and it's just been going up north through Texas and Oklahoma and that's causing dry air coming down is just for huge thunderstorms and so there right now on the area but you can see the Florida area there you go to the next slide that gives us um, some of the um, those white blue areas are the highest density of lightning and again this is a great website buysolid.com if you haven't been out there you gotta check it out this slide is kind of like that's an average Afternoon thunderstorm. I, I, I took a screenshot this a couple years ago in the Tampa Bay area. We had a lot of lightning strikes in the Tampa Bay area. Uh, well, yes, we did. So, so what is the definition though for lightning? Well, I'll read this. This is according to the American Meteorological Society, and they know their stuff, right? The series of electrical processes taking place continuously by which charge is transferred along discharge channels between electric charge centers of opposite sign. And, okay, that's a good definition, but what else do we know about lightning? Well, there's things called pulse lightning, and that's what you see in cloud or multiple clouds. Sometimes you see all the distance, you say, we used to call it, what I was going on, heat lightning. You see lightning, kind of like, thing. Oh, that's really pretty. Still lightning, okay. Then stroke lightning, or cloud ground stroke, lightning discharge that connects a charge region in a cloud to ground. And then flash is one more cloud pulses and or cloud and ground strokes that typically occur with one second. 
Honestly, if it's a stroke or a flash, I really don't care about the definition. I'm disconnecting my radio stuff and my jack. Okay, if you see lightning around and you know it's within a 10 mile area, you need to, you need to get uh, your stuff disconnected to answer that. You need to prepare for that. So now next question, is lightning hotter than the surface of the sun? Well, it's 53,000 degrees Fahrenheit, the surface of the sun is 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So I know it's instantaneous, that's fast, but it's still hotter than the surface of the sun. Just some more information about lightning. You can find that in tornadoes, hurricanes, thunderstorms, volcanic eruptions, nuclear explosions. Okay, so the next time your friend you know, throws out a nuclear bomb, look for lightning, see if you can see it. I don't know how they get this information, but they say you, they do see lightning in nuclear explosions. Um, longest duration, 7.7 .7 seconds. Now you think a lightning struck is pretty instantaneous, but that's a record seven seconds. And then distance, we and don't mean to sort of say like 10 miles, we need to disconnect stuff in our shack. Lightning strikes can have, have, a, have a, up to 200 miles according to this, uh, this calculation here. Now, between Pinellas County and you go straight across the state of Florida, Vero Beach, more or less, 150 miles. Could you imagine a thunderstorm, central Florida, hitting our area? It's a possibility. So I know we all say 10 miles, we need to probably shut stuff down, but you know, it's, uh, it, can be, it can be longer. 10 miles is just not always the, the thing we look at. So lightning statistics, this is interesting. Lightning deaths in the United States uh, in 2020, it's only 17. Yeah, we get a lightning and think, oh yeah, people are getting more lightning struck than that. But it's only 17. A lot of people get struck, but they don't always, you know, have, you know, they don't die from it. But they're worth three in Florida. 85% of lightning fatalities are men. Okay, that just means men are, don't have the same level of confidence that women have. That's just what they say. 32% um, of lightning injuries occur indoors. And this is from the Insurance Information Institute and the CDC. So that's interesting that lightning can occur, uh, injuries can occur indoors. And then lightning claims in 2020, 2.07 billion Dollars. That's a lot of claims. 71,000 claims. Average claim is $28,000. So there's a lot of uh, lot of stuff with lightning. When it comes to energy, that's one thing we think about lightning too. 40,000 to 120,000 volts, 5,000 to 200,000 amps. And you think that okay, calculate wattage, amps times voltage, wattage, right? But a lot of people don't understand. There's also a frequency component to lightning. It can be 10 to 100 megahertz. So there's an RF component. To lightning as well. So, lightning's got it all. Did you know the average lightning bolt is about three h to a half h wide? You say, oh, how do you figure that? But it's at, it's at night, usually when we see them, right? And it's also strong with this type of energy calculation here. It just looks huge. So, but the average lightning bolt, they actually can measure it. It's about about a half inch wide. I'm sure some are bigger than that, but that's what they that's what the calculation is. <laughs> so overall, let's just say, lightning runs is dangerous, and we need to be careful about it. How dangerous is it? Well, some other ham shacks to look at. This was a K, uh, W0ZUX, um, blew up a lot of equipment in a shack. Um, average cost to replace this equipment was th over $3,000. Now, if he had bought like five polyphasers for about 80 bucks a piece, and some ground rod, and some strap, under $1,000, he probably could have protected his shack, but he didn't do that. He's one of these guys that said, lightning's never get my shack, so I'm not gonna worry about it. Okay, let's look at another one here. This was um, uh, the same guy as the chair you saw, it's uh, A4XX. And uh, again, this guy had been 40 years of him. He said, lightning has never hit my shack, it's never gonna hit us. Well, guess what? The other one we have here, this is a uh, electrical panel of a, of a horse barn. Uh, operator was, uh, I don't know how his pulse on here, but he heard the thunder, uh, he was able to disconnect all of his equipment at his house, and the lightning did not hit his house, but it did his horse barn. His horses were fine, by the way, but you can see it really blew up his panel. Next one's got kind of interesting too. We think of the high um, areas of lightning density, you know, Oklahoma, Texas, Florida, Mississippi, whatever. This one is in Manitoba, Canada. I always like to put Canada with it. Because you say Manitoba, some people say, what country is that? You know, um, we, we're good hands and we know TX. 
sorry, Tolino, that's good enough. But uh, you can see Lightning sometimes doesn't always obey, obey your rules. So you can see it went down, it found the path of least resistance, it went over there. So that must have been where the, the wire was uh, was in the wall. Um, but this is managed with Canada. So lots of stuff can happen, it does happen. When we look at Lightning protection, I kind of want to talk about some things you can do to protect your shack from Lightning. And so I got two or three different tips I'd like to look at. So the first one is this. What you can do to protect your shack, you can move. You can move from the Tampa Bay Island. This is, I'm serious, you can move. You can move to Los Angeles. You can move to Washington, Egypt. How about Antarctica? If that, if you move to Antarctica, just think about it. Not only when you'll have no lightning, but when you turn on your radio, you got a pilot, okay? So maybe that's a good place to move to. Um, but they seriously have only 0 to 0.75 strikes per square mile per year compared to the Tampa Bay area. 28 strikes per square mile per year. So, you know, that's one thing. People, I've had people tell me that they don't like the whole life in the Tampa Bay area. I they don't want hurricanes, they don't like tornadoes and things like that too. So, but um, anyway, that's one thing you can do. Another option in what you can do is disconnect everything in your shaft, okay? Your coax lines, you disconnect them from your radio, throw them outside and ground them, by the way. Um, all of your radio equipment, your transceivers, your power supplies, anything that's connected in your shack, you disconnect it. And, and if you do that, you leave your shack. Because if you were to get a lightning strike, it could real elevate you know, the ground potential in your shack. So you do all that stuff every time we have lightning. I'm thinking, that could be two or three times a day. So you have to put it. So I think, do you have any other options? Well, I don't like one and two. <laughs> Let's look at option number three. And this is what I think we should do as ham radio operators. You need to design and install a good ham radio grounding system for your shack. And by good, I mean well designed. And we're going to kind of look at that in the last presentation, part of the presentation here. By the way, I've got stuff I put all around the different tables here. Um, there's, a, there's a copper boot here. Who's got the ARRL handbook, the bonding handbook? I put on one of those. You guys just hold, hold that up for us. That is, there it is, it's over here, how it It's one of the best books ARRL has put out. And it's $22.95, and I hope by the end of this day, all of you who don't have a copy of that book, you go out to Amazon or to ARRL, and you'll order that book. That is a great book. Mine's dog-eared. It's got notes in it. By the way, uh, don't take it home. I'll follow you home because it's my book. I want it back. But it is a great, great handbook. So I really uh, think that you ought to probably look at that. So uh, if you ever heard, heard of uh, H. Ward Silver present, uh, presentations as well, it's a great presenter. And Tasia and I have heard him from on the, the virtual QSO where they have and they're starting back up, I think, in a couple of weeks. Uh, he's done some great presentations. So I think it'd be a good person to listen to if you haven't. You can use Google Watch. I'm looking up on YouTube as well. Um, so grounding design is the next thing we kind of want to look at. So what do we do if I'm wanting to design a ground system for my hand shack? What do I do? Well, look where are you going to locate or relocate your shack? You may think where your shack is now. So well, if I moved it over to this room, I'm closer to I can get my coax out there, I can get my ground panel out there, things like that. So that might be one thing you might want to consider is relocating your hand shack. Then you need to identify what equipment is going to be protected. Your, your transceivers, your tuning, your power supply, your computer, your cable TV coming in, uh, telephone, electrical panel, all this stuff needs to be built into your grounding system. Single point ground panel is a key thing you're being caught. I touched on this in just a few minutes. I hope that if nothing else will take, go home and says, I need to have a single point ground panel. I'm talking a lot about HF antennas, but if you have some uh, UHF, VHF antenna stuff at your house, you still need some to ground it, okay? Because it's still a place where lightning can come into your house, right? So I know you, some people think, well, I've got an antenna in my attic, I really don't need it. Uh, well, that may be one case, but if you've got any exterior antennas on your house, I really think you need to look at a, a grounding design for your house so you can present, protect yourself about that if, but when lightning strikes your house. So ground rod system is another thing to look at. And then um, you also want to look at, um, uh, you want to think like lightning. That's the last thing is. And how do you think like lightning? Well, lightning likes direct paths. If you if you take your ground strap and you take a 90 degree bend in it, lightning can say, I don't know what's going to It's going to go straight. And so think as lightning does. And uh, that will help a lot as you do your design. 
So, um, what is a single point ground panel? It's a single point where you have all your antenna feed lines, control lines, equipment, power, everything are brought in and they share a common connection. It's the one and only place where direct connection is made to your grounding system. Uh, your cable TV, for telephone contacts, etc., etc., and you'd like to put this as close as your AC power entry to your house if you can. My shack, I can't do it because I'm on one side and there's just physically no way to do it. But if you have to design, it says you can put your shack close and your single point ground panel as close to where your electrical uh, AC entrance is to your house, you'll, you'll be in, in good shape. So just keep that in mind as you're doing some design. So what does this look like? Well, you can see the protected side and the unprotected side. There's an alpha, delta, uh, or a polyphase in the middle. There looks like a rotator uh, design, a protector on the right and AC power on the left. And what you want to keep in mind is called the spark gap level, okay? Keep that spark gap level, the unprotected and the protected. And if you keep it that way, keep your coax uh, and all your cables apart like that, uh, you, you don't have a good uh, start of a single point ground panel. This is one that, that is in an even box, but you'll see something in a few minutes where you have it in some, some boxes as well. Hey, question back there. Can you please explain the spark gap level a little better? Well, basically it's the difference between where you have your unprotected and your protected. Okay, and that is your difference. So they got the, the line that's drawn through there. So anything that is below is technically unprotected. Your coax would come in from your antennas, your electric would come in that way, et cetera. Anything on the other side is protected because it has the protection, especially up in the center, that's a, a, a coax um, uh, module that has a, uh, a device in it that when lightning with your striker, you have voltage transient, it grounds all your, your, your cables. So anything on the side, that side, the protected side, that side of the spark gap level is protected. Anything below is unprotected. And so the, the dotted lines look at kind of, you can kind of visually look at that as you set up your own single point ground panels, you can kind of tell what's the spark gap level, what's protected, and what's not protected. That's basically what the, what the answer to that is. The, um, I highly suggest you use copper strap and not wire. A number of different reasons. In fact, there's a piece of copper strap on the table right over here. And um, yeah, there it is. Well, I passed that around, you can look at it. It's a two inch piece of copper strap, George Copper, again, the DX Engineering. Nothing really fancy about it, except that I think it's better used than wire for a number of different reasons. It's low resistance and low impedance. We know about skin effect, right? And um, uh, for an RF where the electrons go on the outside of the conductor and not the inside. So because it's 10 to 100 megahertz, you want, I, I think you're getting better uh, conductivity and connection to your ground if you use copper strap. Uh, there's more current, there's more space that you're actually touching the earth. There's more uh, connection you're having to your ground rod as well. So I'm just a fan of copper strap. Um, and also keep those straps connections. Is, uh, 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 don't don't make 90 degree bends with those. You know, like a two foot radius. If you're going on the side of the house, that's what the best thing to do. I, and I think that's what they say in, in the ARRL book. It does say about two foot radius. So that's a good that's a good rule of thumb to keep in mind. Here's an example of uh, uh, someone's uh, uh, single point ground panel. It's a huge sheet of copper, right? And he's got. Um, Connector down the bottom, SO239 for his uh, uh, equipment come in. He's got stuff on the left there for uh, cable to be grounded as well. So uh, this is a good shape. The only thing I would have done a little differently, you can see you've got a 90 degree bend of the braid that goes into his uh, electrical panel. I would have put it out straight. But, you know, it's, uh, it's just remember, think like lightning. It's like, like light, straight lines, it doesn't like this. Next one is a um, uh, I think it's a K7FP box, and uh, we'll, we'll look at that. It's a great website. If you haven't been out, K7FP is a KS7FP, I think, Metalworks. Yep. It's a great website. In fact, I've got a, a brochure here with one, one of the things passing around. There. Yeah, there you go, on that table. Look through that while I pass it around, take a look at it. Um, I've got two K7FP ground panels. The guy works with you, so how do you want it done? In fact, I asked about a three inch hole here and four inch holes here, how would you like it? He sent me back a graphic, is this what you want? He actually drew it up in publisher or something. This is where you want your holes. I said, yeah, exactly. I said, design, you had a great graphic. Hey, Paul. 
Does he have a ground uh, strap slash wire going inside of the shack from Yeah. There? Well, what this is here, you can see the, uh, the coax is going up into the, these are Morgan uh, coax uh, adapters here. And then it's going up into the, the hole, the kind of goes into a shack. And again, what, what you would say, that is where the spark gap level is. Everything below is unprotected. Everything above going into the shack is protected. And does, does he actually have a ground strap going into the shack? I can't really um, he, I don't know. I imagine he more. would. I know he's got two going down to the ground. And that's, I one, that's one thing. I'm, I'm, I, that's one thing I'm kind of vacillating on. Do I want to yeah. have like a one inch strap? I, I, I put it through like two inch conduit. Yeah, yeah. I have yeah. mine going in my shack because I'm keeping that at my ground level ever better. So if he, may, he may have just like a wire going in there. Right? Yeah, I would. I would think he would. If he doesn't. He hasn't been finished the picture yet. So. Yeah. Next one is another um, K7FP. <coughs> it's just one, um, and going. I think those are Alpha Delta adapters there, and uh, going into the shack. And you've got a single. I would put a, a second ground uh, strap to the ground, but uh, yeah. Uh, can, can you uh, ex can you explain to everybody what the Alpha Delta and Poly the, the thing in the middle? Yeah, explain right. what that actually is. Yeah, those are those are interesting devices. Um, some of them have a capacitor built in for a DC block. Some of them um, are just uh, uh, are straight, but they have a, a, a gas tube uh, basically in there. And so you've got a straight connection with your ground as well as your, as your center of your coax. When you start getting voltage transients on there, or higher voltage, that gas begins to charge and forms a conductor, and so everything is sent to ground is what it does, and it does it within milliseconds or nanoseconds, it does it really fast. And so generally it, it's a protector device, and again, some of them have a, a, a um, uh, the, the polyphasers have a built-in capacitor uh, as well. So you can't run, some people have run DC voltage on their lines and sometimes control some stuff in, in their shack. You can't do that with polyphasers, you can do it with the Alpha Deltas, you can do it with the Morgans, I'm pretty sure. But, but I, I'm using polyphasers just because I just read everything on there. I just think it's a it's a great device. Um, by the way, the little circle things in there, that's that gas tube. And if you were ever get a direct lightning strike and, and, and blow one up, you can unscrew that and you've got an opening on it, you can put another gas tube in. You can't do that with polyphasers. I mean, Morgans, I'm not sure. So that is one advantage to use Alpha Delta. But look through those, those are the three big ones. I would kind of stay away against the NFJ ones, the mighty fine. Sure. Um, anyway, um, I just I would just stay with polyphaser because the price is not that much difference. You might be another fifteen dollars to get a polyphaser or an alpha delta, and I think you'd be better off getting that. But uh, it's versus, a coax device versus the light the light arrestor. Yeah, yeah, and, and technically, it's I, I call it a light arrestor because that's the, my first level. My my uh, that you'll see mine single point ground panel in just a minute. My coax goes to my alpha delta first, and then goes to my uh, we disconnect with my paradigm adapter. So I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but uh, that's that's what it does. It's got that special gas tube in there that when you get transients on that, everything is goes straight to ground, and you're you're you're, you're, you're protected. This is one that um, I don't like. This is not a single point ground panel. Do you see what the the person did here? He looped his coax, and so if you're thinking like lightning. You say, I don't see those. Those are alpha, those are uh, polyphasers, I think. I don't see those polyphasers, lightning arresters. I'm usually going to jump from coax to coax. Because lightning can do what it wants to do, right? And so the best way to do this is retain the spark gap level, have the coax coming down to the bottom of the both polyphasers, and the coax from the top go into your shack. So I know you probably did this for just a, a you know half an extra half an extra service loop or something like that, but he, he should have done it the other way. So I just put that one in. That, remember, keep the spark gap level. And Ward Silver in the book, the AWRL book, talks about that a lot. And so uh, I don't want to take some of his thunder. That, that's a good thing to look at. Um, in for GRC, yeah, here's my grounding station. And it's sort of the things that I have done. So the first thing I did was um, I used copper strap and went around. I got two 20 amp circuits coming from my garage. And so I've got copper strap going behind all my 20 amp circuits. And so that's grounded. Then uh, I built a, um, a grounding bus. And this is just a, uh, you ever been to um, Skycraft Parts, Orlando? Go down the other day. Love that place. So I got some copper there. 
I throw down some plywood, I attach them together with some copper strap, and that <coughs> the end of that copper strap is going down to um, my antennas. There, there's some alpha deltas, a couple of diwas there, and uh, all that is uh, once copper strap at the bottom is going outside, one's going to my grounding bus, and then this goes over to my single point ground pan. Now, some of you are thinking, single point ground pan, let me got two of them. I said, I know, I know, it's just considered one electronic thing. If I had to redesign this, I probably would have got a bigger box and put everything in one box. But I do have everything going to the same ground, that's going to my ground loop, that's going to run my antenna tower pad that is going to get forward in the next few weeks, I hope. Um, but that's what it is. And the next picture kind of shows you where the, um, the door is open um, and what is what I have there. So the first the first door is, uh, these are Paragan. Are you familiar with the guy in uh, Southeast Florida who makes these uh, adapters? And he was at the Plant City uh, Ham Fest a few months ago. And I actually talked with them, bought a couple of them from him. And I had one, I bought a fourth one. So what they do when you have no power uh, connected to these, Everything it goes straight around, and they have some relays in them that keeps the power up when you turn it on. Just 12 volts, but you complete it, everything is completely grounded here when uh, everything is shut off. And you say, "Well, that's great, but aren't you grounded in your shack?" I am. I'm also grounded here. And the next picture, I'm also grounded. Oh, that's that's what the caravan floor looks like. And again, it's, that's I think it's 190 bucks for one of those. So that's that's money. But again. What, what, let's see, what, where did the guy lose in one picture? He lost $3,000 worth of equipment. Now, whether he had ARRL insurance, I don't know, but um, he lost $3,000 worth of equipment. So the next one is the, uh, the right side, and they're my polyphaser adapters. I have two behind the top panel. Uh, those are Morgan um, rotator uh, protectors. And um, down the middle, again, I've got my, um, my coax going out to my paradigms on the left. On the right, there's my coax going. I've only got three antennas connected right now, but I can go up to eight. And again, it's it's the polyphasers, it's a lightning arrestor, so you get one of those high transients from a lightning surge or you know, lightning strike. It'll hit those, the other thing goes straight to ground. Um, and um, that's that's the way my uh, my single point ground panels uh, are set up at this time. And so far it's working good, but you know. I, how many lightning strikes do you need for you to really test it? It's one, right? <laughs> so, yeah, Richie. Yeah, the, um, the, those grant, these uh, Paragon, would you say, slide it, before? It, uh, yeah, if you go back one, yeah, yeah. yeah here again, uh-huh. Is that um, frequency selective, I mean, UHF, VHF, that, HF? That's good, good point, yeah, I meant to bring that up, so I appreciate you mentioning that. Um, I've had a friend, have a friend at work, and he said he got one of these, and he says, it's great in HF, it's the guard's well if the HF UHF. So, so up to 30 megaseconds, it's good? You'll be, in fact, up to six meters, you're probably Six good. meters is good? If you go, again, I have a measured mine. I have mine set up. <clears throat> I guess I'm leaning more on the way. I want my stuff protected. I, I, I just have a measured SWR on, on two meters yet. And so I need to do that, actually do some, do some work. But he's making one, he's designed one for uh, UHF, VHF. Says it works great. He says oh, I can't get my cost under five hundred bucks. I go, whoa, that is kind of that is kind of pricey. He's trying, but because of the equipment he's had to use and the specialized adapters and, and, and chips, because UHF VHF, mm -hmm. you know, he's uh, at that price is for it. Now I'm seeing radio uh, from radio it says yeah. A B. Is that the two lines coming? Yeah, two lines. Yeah, two separate coax lines. Yeah. And then uh, goes so it's the antenna. two se two separate antennas. You can put yes. On. Yes. Okay. Correct. He also makes one with just one antenna. And so if you wanted to, you know, really keep your prices down, so I only want one coax protector, go ahead. You can do that with that one and two. And I think it's like 90 bucks. So that's, that's pretty cheap insurance, look at that. So, okay, let's go back onto um, the ground lot page. And uh, that's the next question. People say, ground lot, how many do I need? Well, I say this, you need one is better than none. And there's some people who have no ground rods, okay? So start at least with one. But my suggestion is I would go four to five as a minimum. Um, again, use the eight foot ground rods, the five eight inch, I suggest. It's got the 10 mil plating. And the reason you do that is because it's just, it's just a better ground rod. Some people ask me, can I use rebar? Well, yeah, you can use anything, metal, I guess. But, you know, a ground rod, in fact, Aragon ground rods, they have the same ones at Home Depot. They're like 15, 18 bucks a piece. 
like, again, this is cheap insurance, okay? You can pound them in the ground. Fat, Pat, I think you've got one of these pounders that puts ground right up in you. So, if you want, don't want to pound the ground, see Pat, he can... <laughs> yeah, right, it's, it's really, it's really pretty fast. In fact, I'm thinking about using this because I've got about another 10 ground rods put in my house. Um, they, go like, they go like butter. What's that? I, got, I got one that goes on an SDS Max. Yeah, it's, oh. It just goes in literally like butter. So you don't even have to force it. You do need to get up on a ladder because it's eight feet. But all of this just goes yeah. straight down. Yeah, now the good thing about the ground lines is in Florida, we've got sand and dirt. We don't have too many rocks. I've got um, my brother and sister live in western North Carolina near Cherokee. And they got nothing but rocks in there. And so they said trying to dry some of the ground in there is really tough. But uh, the good thing can't get Florida, we've got sand or we've got dirt. And so the ground rods do go in pretty easy. But the little the pounder doesn't make it go a lot easier. Um, so the next thing is, what about ground? What's important about this, the, the ground rod itself? So if you think of resistivity, you've got three types of resistance you're looking at for a ground rod. You're looking for the actual ground rod resistance itself. Then you're looking about the ground rod and where it contacts the earth. That's, a, that's an element you look at. Then you've got, you think 3D, you've got concentric shells of earth that is also grounded. Now obviously your grounding increases as you get further, or your resistance increases as you get further and further from the ground line, but that's still part of it. Um, so the next slide kind of talks a bit more about the, um, the, the concentric circles. And um, this is the, the next one I want to look at is what you really need to be careful of. You don't you, it's wrong to put your ground rods too close. The rule of thumb is if you've got an eight foot ground rod, you want two times that distance for your next one, or 16 feet. If you have a 10 foot ground rod, you want two times that distance for your next one, or your concentric circles will overlap, and you actually will kind of lose your, uh, some of your grounding capability. Now, I've had some people from time ask me, well, what if eight ground, foot ground rods are great, um, what about 10 foot ground rods? Because they make those, maybe I should get some of those or they better. And my technical answer to that is, eh, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you've got two more foot of ground in, in, in the ground, on a ground rod in the ground. Yeah, I know. But at the same time, is that you've got to pound that two more foot into the ground. And it's, I'm sure some West Village there can find, yes, you've got better grounding if you use 10 foot ground rods. Personally, I would like to see someone with a perimeter ground with eight foot ground rods in their house instead of like four or five 10 foot ground rods. I think that's better. So, and besides, you can get the eight foot ground rods at Home Depot, you can have them at your house, and you can, and you can get your walk started this weekend. All right, so I say, I say same with the eight ones. The uh, next one is um, Erico um, Pad Weld, it's called, if you see the exothermic welding, where you actually you know, you put this powder in, you light it. Boom! Big flash and actually welds the, your wire to to the uh, to the ground rod. I know they make it for the strap. I just don't have it for the strap because I'm doing another type of um, welding. I'm actually brazing or welding with silver solder, not silver solder, but silver silver rod. Uh, my ground rod to the um, to the strap. Now you don't you don't want to solder. No, this is not soldering. This is brazing or welding. If you were to solder that, lightning hits that, it will vaporize that solder. The solder melts at what, 700 degrees? How much temperature is the lightning strike, right? And so you want to weld or brace. Yeah, it, it's hot, it's hot. Um, and then the big thing is use copper goop for all your mechanical connections. In fact, you've got a can of copper goop right there. I might well pass it around that some other people want to look at it. Um, I call it copper goo, but I know they call it copper paste and everything. I put a little bit in a little bag here so I can show what it looks like. If you've ever used this stuff, you know, it gets all over you. You need two rolls of paper towels to use this stuff. Because you'll get it on you, you'll get it on your radio, you'll get it on your coax, everything. But it's great stuff. It's anti galling So if you put it on, uh, even in stainless steel, a fastener, sometimes you put it on the ground, and sometimes they will even rust eventually. This stuff will prevent anything from rusting. So this stuff. Uh, Good stuff. Um, so there's a picture of copper goop, and uh, there's a picture of the exothermic welding device. Where'd you find that? The exothermic? Yeah. Uh, it's not graphic online somewhere. 
Uh, I think Erico, Erico makes these. Go find a YouTube, it's super cool. Yeah, oh, oh yeah, I've got a couple of links at the end. I, have found, I, have, I, have, I, have, I was looking, trying to decide. Yeah. I've, uh, I've got a couple of links in the, in the, in the show notes here, and it, it shows a couple of links for the YouTube videos, how Erico from um, Cadwell works, it's pretty cool. So the next one actually shows the, you know, what the ground, uh, after you do the work, what it looks like, and then uh, it goes on the ground rod and ground, and then um, some people like to weatherproof it, I'm kind of both ways on it. Again, it's probably going to be safe, safe without weatherproofing, but you know, if you're going to bury it, I guess you could you know, put some weatherproofing or some of that. Uh, the, the, uh, the weatherproofing, um, I say glue with the brush on stuff. You can use that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, there it is. That's exactly where it is. Yeah. Um, now, the next picture, this is uh, just a sample. This is uh, the ground rod that I raised, welded at my house. Uh, it's a settling torch, right? And uh, it's, it looks a little messy around there, but it's, it's well, it's well welded. <coughs> I think, let me see if I can take one of these off. And I had to heat that thing up like you would not believe. It's hard to take one off. And so that's really the best way to do it. And the reason I'm, I would like to do that, someone's got one of the clamps uh, around here. Yeah, there's uh, there is. Um, Paul's got that. That's the clamps you get DX engineering. And those clamps are pretty good, but that, that clamp is 30 bucks. Okay. 40. 40, okay. It's 40 nine, bucks. I just bought nine of them. Yeah, so that's great to use, okay? And there's nothing wrong with it. It's just I'm trying to save some money because I've got like 16, 20 drum rocks going around my house. And so I'm just like, okay, I can weld and I can, I can do it this way. So you can use the clamps, you can use the brake welding, but again, you don't want to solder. Um, perimeter ground. Now, what is a perimeter ground? This attaches to your um, single point ground panel. And some people say, well, maybe I don't want a perimeter ground. You know, guys, I, I think investing in your grounding system will just, you know, well, let's face it, you, you, you don't want to spend the money. You'd rather spend a thousand dollars on a rig or something like that. I get it, I would like to do the same thing. But I, I want my health protected, I want my radios protected, and I, I want to have some peace of mind that as lightning's gonna hit my house, I've, I've got some, I've got a good amount of protection, okay? So perimeter ground is part of that. It stands around the building. There's two purposes for the perimeter ground. It conducts surge generating uh, energy around the building, minimizing ground potential. So if lightning were to hit like one side of your house, the perimeter ground keeps that at a minimum. The difference in uh, uh, the difference in the ground potential there. The second thing is you've got more points, more copper in the ground, and more lightning raw or grounding rods that sink that current to ground. So that's another good thing to have when you have a more uh, perimeter ground. And, so, and you know, and Ward Silver says, look, look, if you can only go three-fourths around your house, that's not bad, that's pretty good. And you'll see my, um, my panel here, I can't go all the way around my house because I've got a driveway. So, so. The, um, again, the thing about perimeter ground, you wanna ground and bond all the stuff in your house to it, your air conditioner, <coughs> If you have a fuel tank, a propane fuel tank, you want to go ahead and bond that to your ground rod uh, or your ground perimeter as well. And there's a good um, uh, National Edu um, Electrical uh, NEC has um, special wiring requirements, and there's a, there's a link that Ward Silver puts in his book as well. That's a good thing to look at. So all that stuff needs to be bonded. Yeah, I've got my shed bonded. I've got my chain link fence bonded to my perimeter ground. So those are things that you can keep as well. Um, here's a little picture of uh, my uh, ground strap going in. That's a picture of uh, one of the bonds I have. I just I put in a piece of you know Tupperware here. It's just it kind of works. Maybe it's keeping some of the uh, corrosion off of it. I don't really do that everywhere on the ground, but I did on this one. Now the next one is this is my my home and, and the ground shack there. So you can see that in the middle, the black uh, square in the middle. That's my hand shack. Then going out, that's my grounding um, strap that goes to um, my grounding panels, the two little black in the middle there, those are my single point ground panels. And then I'm going up to the left and going around to the right. So what I've got, I haven't have done 100% yet, but I've got everything to the left done, everything to the right done to the lower right corner of, the, of my house there. I've got ground rods in there. So I need to come around to my electrical panel. Now you see, 
Well, your electrical panel isn't, yeah, I know. Yeah, every, every place isn't perfect, but getting your electrical panel on your perimeter ground as well as the rest of your shack is going to keep that ground potential at, at, uh, at a low, at the same, a similar level. Now, if I really run into, um, if I want to dig up my asphalt driveway, I could put it around the top of the picture, but like I said, how much more money do you want to spend? So I got kind of into my life, and she said, you really want to do it, don't you want to do that? Doing so now we work out. So <laughs> try to make people happy. Um, the next one is uh, how, do any of you have a home that has air terminals on their house? It's a little the little grounding rods that sometimes you'll see on commercial buildings. Um, I was talking with Tom Schaefer a couple of years ago. I said, you know what one has um, um, uh, air terminals in the house? He says, I've got a 40 foot air terminal in my house. It's called my, it's called my radio tower. And I said, yeah, that's, really, that's a pretty, pretty good uh, idea, thing to keep in mind. So um, some people have air terminals on their houses. I'm kind of both ways. If you've got a well-protected and grounded house, maybe you don't need them. If some of them put them in for you, that might not my keep in mind. But if you do have a 40, 50-foot tower at your house, I mean, that is an air terminal because it's well-grounded, just like these, uh, these air terminals are well-grounded. The next one's kind of an interesting picture of well-grounded. This is, uh, this is Duke Energy, Citrus County remote um, uh, combined cycle power plant of the Crystal River. And uh, those are 20 foot tall air terminals. It goes to a two watt wire to a ground, and that goes all the way around the administration building, and then it goes all, they have air terminals throughout the entire rest of the power plant. And uh, they're serious about wanting to protect against lightning at Duke Energy and the power plants. And most of our power plants have such a type of uh, grounding. Um, the next one is kind of an interesting one. I saw someone put this online. I found this on YouTube. Someone oh, this is this the remote? Yeah, this is yeah. The you can see, yeah, I know that Raspberry Pi, but it but, controls it. Yeah. Yeah, but what it does, you know, you can see where it's, it's pushing in the adapters to the poly polyphaser um, lighting uh, arresters there, and uh, so. I don't know if it works or not. It, uh, it doesn't ground everything on the right, whereas you know, probably they either would. So, but what, it's, real quick, that's it's his remote shack up in the mountains in Arizona, where there's a lot of lightning. Uh -huh. So he operates remote there, but he's not oh. there physically. He operates okay. from home. Okay. So he wanted a system. He's got a car battery for backup, so that and the, the Pi has a thing where that controls it also through a web page and all okay. this stuff. So cool. he's ready to operate. It is, I was trying to find him. He connects to the 7300. He can do his thing. But yeah, he has a button on his little web page that controls, goes to the Pi. Okay. It closes the, those slip connectors. I'm not sure what those kind are. But uh, yeah, I just saw this just the other day. Um, yeah. that when if, if all the power fails, everything, uh, it fails back open. So okay. it doesn't stay closed and then possibly get fried. So wow. it's really neat to see. Yeah, well, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's a prototype he's got there. Yeah, well, I, I, I think it was a YouTube where I found the link, but I was looking for it, and I couldn't find it. So I thought I'd put it in there because kind of thanks for the, for the detail on that. Um, I've got a lot of the different um, references here, and we're going to put the uh, the presentation up on the website, and so you can look at that at the different um, the different links and things that have at the end. So this um, this one here is about uh, you think you know lightning. Um, but again, Vaisala is a great website. Uh, obviously, stuff um, uh, from ARRL, they have a lot of good information there. Um, Erico has a good uh, website as well. The doctor will see you, they're not doing that anymore on ARRL, but there were some good presentations about grounding. Again, Erico is on there, and um, those are the exothermic wells. You can look at those on YouTube, they're kind of cool to look at. And, uh, and here's K7FP. This guy's got a great website, good equipment, not just single point ground panel boxes. But uh, other stuff, and he, like I said, he will work with you, work with you, whatever you need. He'll tell you what you can do, communicate with you. It's usually like a six week wait, wait time because he actually builds these for you. I got one coming too fast. Yeah, yeah, and, but it's, uh, he's a great guy to work with. The whole little grommets you can get extra. Yeah, yeah, and all you, tell, pieces. you tell him what you want, he'll, he'll get it for you. So, yeah. Okay, so last slide here is. Protect your shack every time, and your Q, when you leave your QTH or your, uh, your Go QRT, that means disconnect all your antennas. And people say, well, if you're grounded in shack, do you actually disconnect the coax to your radio? And I do. Now, you say, well, I've got everything grounded, I should be okay. It doesn't take me that long to disconnect the one my radio to. Okay? And, uh, you see, did you get it outside though? Or, or throw the cables outside, you made it kind of Yeah, it, it, I was going to say, that was like the second the second suggestion. If you don't have a grounding design oh, panel, okay, yeah. 
throw everything outside, you have to disconnect everything. And so, but I physically disconnect the, the coax going to my radio when I'm done for the day. And I just, yep. that's just that's what my habit is. Um, then leave your hand shack during a storm. I don't care how well protected you are. You could have that lightning could hit your house and you get that, could raise that voltage up just in your shack. So if one get away from there. And I say invest a single point ground panel. Um, and do a perimeter ground in your house. Like I said, your, uh, your flex rate is 64 right? Well, thank you very much. Hey, Glenn? Yes. One of, the, <clears throat> one of the things that's been suggested to me is to uh, connect up your copper plumbing to your single point ground. If you know that your copper plumbing doesn't have a PVC, yeah, like in the middle of it, some do, some don't. If you know it's there and you know it's your, or if you've got an older house in Florida like I do, uh, it's, 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 nice house, it's all copper. If you know it's all copper, great. Newer houses, um, 70s, 80s, they yeah. mixed it. Yeah. And so and if you know, and I guess the way you, you can actually measure it, and you can go from point to point. If you know it's grounded, yeah, connect it to your copper well, The reason for that is because you have things like your disposal and stuff are hooked to your electric and then it's also hooked into the into the plumbing and yeah. so, so therefore it doesn't jump and arc between your plumbing and the electric because you want it all to elevate it when yeah. there's a lightning strike nearby and all right, to right. go down to say the, the other thing is what we call a U for ground and I kind of go into all the details in, in our presentation today, but that's when you actually connect it to grounding that's in your that's port base uh, of your of your house. And if you if you have built in a house in your ham and you want to do a U for ground have copper strips connected to the rebar in the concrete base, and you can have several places and do your perimeter ground. It's kind of hard to retrofit it, but uh, for my um, my pad that I'm going for my tower, I'm putting a couple of copper straps that you for ground and coming out there as well. So, okay, yes. Oh, uh, if you have a, a hot water heater, especially if it's copper lines, you know, between between the cold water inlet and your hot water outlet. Uh, definitely you want to have a bond strap on that mm -hmm. because you think that your water tank would probably at the ground. Actually, I had a, I took a lightning, well actually it wasn't a direct hit, but it hit my neighbor's palm tree that was what, 60 or 70 feet away and it actually energized it, went back and then bounced oh, through the wow. wash, actually through a stainless steel braiding of my washer and then popped a few things that way. And a simple strap would have taken care yeah. of it. Yeah, simple things we can do to keep the stuff from happening. Yes, um, you're saying that you should, you're tying your ground system into the, uh, the cage of the tower base? Yeah. I always thought that that's not a good thing to do. I, you know, if the, the, the jury is out. Some people say do, some people say don't. If it's done well, a U for ground will not cause, because you probably heard the same thing, lightning will cause the moisture in that to explode or something like that. I, I've, heard, I've heard that before and, and other things. If it's done right and it's connected to your your grounding and what that, that copper strap or copper wire is connected to the grounding, uh, the rebar, and if that rebar is not just twist tied, but it's actually welded together. It's a yeah. welded cage. Yes, yeah, it's got it's got to be welded. It can't be twist tied. If you have done work with rebar, you can twist tie it. When you twist tie to hold it, but then you weld it. And so it's got to be got to be welded. At least seventy percent of the weld. Right? And that's good to do seventy percent, just do hundred percent of the weld. You know, so yeah, good good point. A couple more questions and then uh, yes, yes, yes good so any, okay, two more questions and then okay, yes. What are your options for protecting something like an internet wire that comes into the house and right into a chair? From coming into a house and right into a chair? Yeah, you yeah. have like an infed wire. An infed? Yeah, someone was asking about infed earlier too. If you could go through any type of a uh, grounding protector, for at least I would use like a polyphaser or a, put that right on the right on the connection of the I, and I would put it as, as soon as your wire comes down before it comes to the house, I think that's the place to put it. You know, so you could also use an external tuner. Yeah. Switch to an external tuner. Well, you know, because a lot of those run off the DC bias on the coax, right? Yeah, but you can protect that. Is it is it ladder line or is it coax? Uh, it's just a wire. <laughs> okay. Okay, just a wire. Okay. Yeah. I, I, would, I would go when it comes to the ground, I would probably use some type of a, uh, a grounding adapter clamp or a, a polyphaser or an alpha delta right there. And be sure it's grounded. If you put one ground rod in, I think we're two or three. Yeah, yeah, I already got, I already got two ground rods. Okay. I'm going to put my copper pipe. 
Okay. 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 Sounds like it. That sounds like the way to do it. Okay. Last question. No touch questions. Okay.